The trap is that you are talking about yourself in a way that actually holds you back, that impedes healing and growth. The tactic is that by self-gaslighting, you may be dialing down the amount of abuse that is happening in the relationship. I'm going to be talking a little bit about trauma bonding today, which I talk about a lot, but I'm going to be talking about it in a very specific way and really going to be breaking down this question. And I wonder how many of you ask yourself this question. Why do I feel like I'm the bad person in my narcissistic relationship? Have any of you ever asked yourself that question? Like, I feel like I'm the bad one. If you do, drop it in the comments. It'd be interesting to see how many of you watching this saying, yes, I feel like I'm the bad one. We're going to break that down before we get to that gentle reminder, go to those video notes. If you do feel like you're the bad person, you do need some healing. Come join us in this healing program and hit that link. And also please subscribe if you're new to this channel. If you end up liking this video, tiny bit of validation goes a long way for me. So let's take this question on around trauma bonding and self-blame. But why is it in narcissistic relationships that people, despite being narcissistically abused, that so many people feel like they are the bad person? in these relationships. So at this point on this channel, on this YouTube channel, we have talked about trauma bonding ad nauseum, what it is, the th different things that, that sort of describe trauma bonding. But mostly we talk about how trauma bonding keeps us stuck in these relationships or drawn to narcissistic relationships in the first place. What about after you decide to do something about your narcissistic relationship? Maybe you decide to end your relationship or maybe you decide to go no contact with someone or you massively gray rock or firewall or not only disconnect from the narcissist, but all of the enablers. You do that and then you look at the narcissistic person and they actually kind of seem sad to see you go or they seem kind of lost without you or they kind of slump about in a victimized way. Now, they may still also do and say manipulative, gaslighting, mean things when you're around them, but once you decide to do what you do, to step away maybe, you can see that they're impacted by it, even if they don't say it. And it's at that point, that point when they're like, oh, this person's a little hurt. Nearly every survivor of narcissistic abuse I have ever talked to or worked with will say, Ugh, I feel like I'm the bad person. I feel like I'm a bad person because I'm not talking to them anymore or I'm not engaging or I'm, bad, I'm setting these boundaries with my parent or my ex or my adult child or my friend or my sibling. I feel like I'm mean. I feel like I've become so dark hearted. And then it starts to slip pretty quickly from there and people start thinking, maybe I'm a monster. Maybe I'm the narcissist. Pushing back on narcissistic abuse is no joke. It sounds so easy in words. Oh, don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, gray rock, don't respond, walk away. Intellectually, we can all acknowledge that those are all choices and probably good ones in a narcissistic relationship. But when you make those choices, you feel sick. Many people literally report feeling sick to their stomachs, losing their appetite, getting headaches, just because they're setting consistent boundaries or when they finally say enough is enough and don't engage. You know the dance. You all do. You know that if you stay in this relationship, nothing's ever going to change. And many people do stay just so they don't have to feel sick and don't have to feel like the bad person to not have to feel like that mean person. Actually doing it, actually setting the boundary, actually not engaging, actually seeing that when you pull away, yeah, yeah, in more than a few cases, the narcissistic person may look lost or sad or pathetic. They may actually look like they miss you or they tell you how much you ruined their lives or they go really heavy on all the self-victimized stuff. It's a terrible feeling. It's as though every trauma-bonded cell in your body orients toward not wanting to be the one that feels like the bad one, the mean one, the cold one. And you may even feel that perhaps this relationship is sort of your penance or your bad luck and you stick it out so you don't have to feel like a bad person. If you really want to hear a sick twist on this one, 
I was raised in a very traditional Hindu South Asian family where I have had n contact with many, many people who are in terrible marriages or, fa or terrible family situations say, I am being punished from my behavior in a past life. I must owe this person, and they're talking about the abuser, something. So I'm telling you now, I know about some deep trauma-bonded cultural religious stuff that can twist a person's mind. So many survivors of narcissistic abuse are at risk for feeling that it's easier to take the role of enduring the narcissist's BS and maltreatment than it is to walk away and manage not only dis the discomfort of feeling like the cruel one, but also manage all the criticisms you'll get from people outside of you, outside of the relationship. Now, there's no easy answer here. It's a process. You do have to pay attention to how you feel. Now, when the narcissist is cut out of your life and they're not around, you're going to feel better in many ways, less stressed, more content, maybe even happy. Over time, you may feel more brave, courageous, and the less and less contact you have with the narcissist, maybe even less plagued by self-doubt. While some narcissists don't care if you leave, many do. And remember that abandonment and, and related issues are a part of narcissism. So they may actually not do well when you go. And there will be times you will be ruminating on that icky, awful feeling of having done something to someone that does not feel good to you. The more empathic you are, the more this way of thinking is going to bring you down. Sadly, this is where your empathy, a wonderful part of you, is actually kind of keeping you stuck. Your empathy makes you vulnerable to falling back into it as well because you don't want to feel like a bad person because you're not. This is the legacy of narcissistic abuse I actually hate the most. The idea that stepping away and setting boundaries and saving yourself, that you have to carry along with that, this burden, that you're not a nice person. And sadly, the prevailing wisdom in the world is that the people who put up and shut up are somehow, maybe they're not so mean, right? Because it means that at some level, survivors of narcissistic abuse cannot win. They, they either have to be abused in the relationship or live with this sense that you did something bad. Well, here's the good news. Over time, that idea that you are bad, it'll slowly fade. Narcissistic abuse changes us in permanent ways. It means that we cannot live like little children in a fantasy world anymore. That we recognize that life is a series of really hard choices that are often unpopular, especially if we are trying to attempt to protect ourselves. And there is no magical moment when a fairy god person comes down and waves a wand and makes the trauma bonds go away or gives us a happy ending after our trauma bonds. Nope. Survivors of narcissistic abuse learn that to set boundaries and disengage is uncomfortable and unpopular. And with time, we recognize that no, we are not bad people, but that we did have to save ourselves. And yet that felt really uncomfortable. Many of you know that I believe that a major part of healing is journaling and record keeping. A powerful method of doing that, pessimistic and awful as it feels, is to write down all of the bad things that happened in the relationship. I want you to keep all of the abusive text messages and emails. When those trauma-bonded feelings come up, when you feel guilty or bad or mean, please read all of that. When you feel that you are being mean or bad or misreading the situation, going back and seeing all that stuff you wrote down that, that was sent to you, it can be eye-opening and it can be your salvation. At some level, getting out of a toxic relationship and the bad feelings that accompany it are a form of survivor guilt. Self-preservation and self-protection are all very nice sounding words, but putting them into practice is a whole other level. And it's, and it's a whole nother experience for people who are trauma bonded. You always feel like you're trying to swim against some kind of psychological current or riptide. So no, I'm here to tell you, you are not a bad person for setting boundaries and disengaging and creating distance from someone who harmed you and will continue to harm you. You made a choice to take care of yourself. The narcissistic person is making a choice too to abuse people, including you. They have the freedom to make another choice. They just aren't. 
Their bad choice, though, cannot remain your prison. Hope that makes sense. But that thinking I'm the bad person for these things I'm doing in this relationship, like distancing myself and seeing the victimization on their face, you are not a bad person. That is a classic manipulation, and I want to break you out of that. I understand it's uncomfortable, but all growth is uncomfortable. So let's talk about this issue of second guessing and indecision and self-doubt. That is such a classical part of narcissistic abuse. To me, this is the signature pattern of narcissistic abuse. The no longer able, being able to trust your own decisions, your own opinions, your own thoughts. As time goes on, it gets so extreme, you stop trusting your own instincts about everything, even if you are hungry or tired. You get so used to the narcissist telling you that you're hungry or telling you whatever you are, that it's as though you have been hijacked in every possible way. A primary reason of this pattern, for this pattern of second guessing and self-doubt, and that it is so central in narcissistic abuse, is really because of the gaslighting. Really think about it. Gaslighting, which is the deliberate denial of your reality, is designed to foster self-doubt. If you are told you are too sensitive, you start doubting your level of emotionality. If you are told something didn't happen, you doubt your memory. If you are told you have no right to feel that way, you doubt your right to feel. Your doubts and second guessing may look lots of different ways. You might think, maybe I am making too big a deal out of her text to that guy she works with. Maybe I am being too selfish by trying, go, trying to go back to school and get that degree. Maybe he did tell me that he was going to be working late. I don't remember. Maybe I am being too hard on my mother. She did make sure we had dinner most nights. Maybe I shouldn't expect so much. This pattern of second guessing starts down a spiral toward making you indecisive in all realms of your life. It makes sense. A key part of narcissistic abuse is constantly you trying to do the impossible, which is to please the unpleasable narcissist. So you do everything you can do to win them over. In essence, you give up on yourself to please them. You take on their interests, go to places that they want, eat the foods they want at the times they want, have conversations about things they want, mostly conversations about them and what they're interested in. You learn to not ask for anything you need or want or ever voice a preference. So over time, yeah, you actually do start to lose touch with what does matter to you, which may even be about survival. It's painful to think about the things that matter to you, since you can only do them on the, on the times that you are away from the narcissist. I remember one couple in particular. The husband was a controlling, neglectful, egocentric. He was just a simply dreadful person. The woman was actually quite kind and empathic and asked for very little from life and, you know, from the world. They lived in a relatively large home and she loved purchasing these little knickknacks and, I don't know, little pictures and things like that on her little trips or in local shops. Nothing fancy, nothing expensive. He refused to let her put the art that she enjoyed on the walls or on the shelves. And the few times she would actually do it, he would criticize her so mercil mercilessly that she decided it wasn't worth it. And over time, she packed up her little treasures and put them away. But sadly, over time, and in parallel to this, this woman also stopped being able to ask for anything she wanted, even with other people outside of the narcissistic relationship. He just sort of bullied and took over everything in her life. 
they ate when he wanted and they ate what he wanted. They went on vacation only when he wanted to where he wanted. They watched the TV programs he wanted. She was just sort of a sad additional occupant of her own home. Why and what could she have done? Possibly, how could she have possibly learned to voice her preferences? So what this means is that in some ways you lose practice in making a decision or being confident in your choices. On top of that, if you do weigh in on a decision with a narcissist, they will either reject it and berate it, or if they do accept it, blame you for years if it did not go the way that they had wanted. So after a while, you just stop trying and definitely stop trusting your own judgment. This can really hamstring people in a profound way. People may find that even when they are not with a narcissist, they are unable to weigh in on a decision. They'll say things like, oh no, we can go anywhere you want for dinner, I'm good. I don't, I don't care what movie we watch, we can go to any movie. We can do whatever you want tonight. We can get together whatever time you want. Because you're so used to, to capitulating and you're so unused to making decisions and having your decisions respected or living in fear of making the wrong choice, in addition, it can also hurt you in your professional spaces, not just in where should we go to dinner, but it can hurt you in the professional spaces like your career or in making professional choices. You may not weigh in on important decisions in the workplace or you may hesitate so much that you don't get inv advanced in a job because you're considered to be too tentative. You may waffle between two choices for too long and miss a deadline. You may not know what classes to take and then don't put your form in early enough so you end up getting none of your classes. Your inability to make choices can really be a major weight that holds you back in all kinds of professional endeavors and frankly, in all kinds of relationships. As I noted above, or during this video, it's not just the challenges in making decisions and second guessing yourself. It's also the giving in. It's also what I'm calling the capitulation. You may give in on everything, even things that matter to you, because the mantra of the narcissistic relationship is that you go along to get along. And because so many people who come from narcissistic families or who have stayed in narcissistic relationships are people pleasers, the giving in and just not making your needs known so you can please the narcissist becomes dangerous second nature for you. The second guessing that is such a classical part of narcissistic abuse starts in an obvious place and it is a little different than the decision making challenges. It's the doubts that plague you after you make the decision. It almost takes the joy out of life. You then sit down and say, I'm worried I ordered the wrong thing at the restaurant. I must have chosen the wrong restaurant. I should have bought the other dress. I never have should have gone to that event. I should have stayed home instead. We should have never bought that car. We should have bought that house instead. A big part of the ruminative pattern can be the second guessing to the point where you literally get paralyzed, distressed, or really, really upset. Now, obviously, all of this kind of exists under the banner of self-doubt. Being in a narcissistic relationship, coming from a narcissistic family, working in a narcissistic and toxic workplace, because you're being so regularly gaslighted, manipulated, invalidated, and belittled, you are constantly plagued by self-doubt. The most central self-doubt emanates from the other mantra of all narcissistic relationships. I am not good enough. If that is your starting off place, you can see how doubting yourself at every turn in the road is going to do you in. You talk yourself out of everything. I don't have what it takes to finish my master's degree. 
I'm never going to make the soccer team. I don't have a chance of getting that promotion. I could never write a book. I'm not going to get hired for that job. You know the drill. You talk yourself out of it before you even get to the starting gate. Ironically, I know I talked about sleep problems in this series. Self-doubt and second guessing are the things that keep you up at night. Boom, wake up at two in the morning, you're full of self-doubt, just like rumination, it's what keeps you up. Personally, as a survivor of more than a few narcissistic relationships, this particular symptom feels personal to me. I own it because it's the one that has done the most damage in my life. I have screwed up major life decisions because of my struggles with self-doubt and indecision. I still doubt myself in many areas. And yeah, even after I research and I develop and I shoot a video, I will doubt that it made its point. I'll doubt that it makes sense. I'll doubt that it's clear. And I'm mercif mercifully, I have an extraordinary team that works with me to reassure me. But years, years I've been working through this and I've been trying to push through. But damn, 54 years old, I'm still not past this one. The things the narcissist does are a setup for self-doubt, second-guessing, and indecision. I hope there are some of you watching this who maybe don't have a narcissist in your life, but are watching this as a supporter of someone who has endured or is enduring narcissistic abuse. Please understand that they're not being indecisive because they're slow-witted or ridiculous. This is actually really hard for them. So what do we do? And let's see if I could take my own advice since this is my issue too. First of all, make some decisions. Start with some low stakes ones. Chocolate or vanilla, paper or plastic, fries or onion rings. Just make a choice. Make it from the gut and stick with it. Then you can advance to bigger ones. In the worst case, you should have gotten the chocolate. Number two, make some non-observed decisions. For many people going through narcissistic abuse, it can be even more difficult if they feel their choice is being scrutinized. Make some choices without an audience. It may feel like lower stakes, and it may build up your confidence in making choices. Number three, and this is a common one, make a pro and con list, but I want you to make a pro and con list with a twist. For, like a, for a bigger decision, for example, like which apartment to rent, which car to purchase, which job to take, make a pro and a con list because it's a good thing to do. But then I want you to make a third column on your pro and con list. And I want that to be called, what am I worried about and whose voice am I hearing? Many times you know you want, for example, you know the apartment you want, you're like, bang, that's the one. But you hear the voice of the narcissist saying, ugh, this isn't a very hip neighborhood or mm, what an ugly building. I wouldn't be caught dead there. But if you love this apartment, well, let's say you're buying a car and you decide you want to get the cheaper car so you can save for school. Again, you got to ask yourself when you're having trouble with this decision, looking at your pro and con list, whose voice is it? Is it the narcissist saying, ah, you're not going to have any game if you're driving that old car? That third column in your pro and con list is really important because once you can see how much their BS is impeding your decision making process, you may be more willing to make a choice that works for you and understand how their voice is what's messing up the work works. And you know what's next. You know, you can tell me what tip four is going to be therapy. Play out your choices with your therapist. We're neutral parties and we might be able to help you break some of this choice down. Remember, we don't have skin in the game. We don't care what car you buy. Number five, do some mental exercises. Mentally play out the decisions in your mind. Close your eyes and really play them out and pay attention to how you feel. Connecting your feelings and your choice can also help you climb this indecisive mountain. This is one of those patterns that can be really quite tough to break. Think of the bright side. You did choose to watch this video. Now go make a choice to do something, anything that's good for you. Each choice 
is a fresh start. Making decisions begets making more decisions. And if you always pay attention to it's that narcissistic voice, that naysaying voice that pushes the second guessing, the indecision, the self-doubt, that you can, you can start dismantling this piece by piece and slowly start trusting your judgment. And sometimes you might just decide to get the chocolate and the vanilla. Let's just see it that way. So let's start with the simplest trap of all, self-gaslighting. So let's just do a brief review of gaslighting in general terms so we're all on the same page. It's a five-step process. Step one, the relationship has some sort of trust or expertise built into it. Could be a partner. It could be a new person you want to win over for some reason. It could be a family member, maybe some kind of person with expertise that you need to work with or a boss. As a result, you are willing to believe them and trust them. Step two, they start to steal your reality. The, that never happened. I never said that. Are you sure that really happened? I never got your text. I never sent that email. All of that can confuse you and leave you with lots of self-doubt. In step three, they paint you out as having something wrong with you. You are too sensitive you must be mentally ill. Is your memory okay? Have you been taking your medications? You need help. Your anxiety is out of control. Step four, they keep repeating this process to the point where you become reliant on their version of reality because you have so doubted your own. You pretty much completely abandon yourself and your reality and you become indoctrinated into the cult of them. Step five, you have lost your sense of you and what you are and who you are and to the world because you just go along with everything the narcissist is doing now. It looks like you're in agreement with the narcissistic person and part of a united front. But we could add a step six to this. And it is something that people in narcissistic relationships do. The person in the relationship gaslights themselves. Maybe I'm too sensitive. My anxiety is probably really hard to live with. Ugh, I'm so dumb. It's amazing. I get anything done. Uh, let me double and triple and quadruple check that my mind isn't that sharp anymore. That's what self gaslighting looks like. Now, self gaslighting is clearly a byproduct of being in a narcissistic relationship where you experience the gaslighting, and it becomes part of your language. But we also need to be aware that there is another dynamic present in self-gaslighting, which is that it is a way to appease the narcissist. In some ways, to keep the relationship going in a way that they get to keep their power and you may avoid their rage. Self-gaslighting delivers a sense of superiority to the narcissistic person, to their sense that they are the ones who have it together and that you are the one who is the weak link in the relationship. Most people do not consciously self-gaslight for this goal. They self-gaslight because it has been done to them so many times that pretty much we kind of internalize the dynamic. But the self-gaslighting also gives a sort of secondary, I don't know, benefit, if you will, of protecting a person who is in a narcissistic relationship. In a way, self-gaslighting is a way of getting ahead of the abuse. If you are already saying out loud that you are the one who is too sensitive or slow-witted or losing your mind or your memory, then other than agreeing with it, there isn't much more that the narcissist can bring to the table at that point. Perhaps it's a way for us to maintain control. If we're the ones harming ourselves, then it's a bit more controlled and predictable than when the narcissistic person does it to us. The sad part is whether we are gaslighting ourselves or the other person is gaslighting us, it is harming us. It is shaping our sense of selves and 
our identity. So the irony of self-gaslighting is that the trap becomes a tactic. The trap is that you are talking about yourself in a way that actually holds you back, that impedes healing and growth. The tactic is that by self-gaslighting, you may be dialing down the amount of abuse that is happening in the relationship because you are getting ahead of them and gaslighting yourself before they can gaslight you. For many people stuck in narcissistic relationships, the sense of helplessness and powerlessness and just generally feeling out of control of what is happening to them is such an overwhelming feeling. Self-gaslighting sadly may just create something called congruence in the relationship. That basically means that for better or worse, the pieces fit. You're doubting yourself. They're doubting you. It sort of knocks the dissonance out of place. And when the pieces fit, even when it harms us, it also releases some tension. But while self-gaslighting is a sort of workaround, it is a deeply unhealthy one. And echoes of self-gaslighting can persist for a lifetime. The challenge is to catch it and correct it. But while you are in the narcissistic relationship, it's really very difficult because even if you find a way to dial down the self-gaslighting, the narcissist is there making sure that you get gaslighted one way or another. Like I said, it's a trap that's a tactic that goes back to being a trap. So let's take on this issue because what I'm about to talk about is really a little bit like punching yourself in the face, but it's a thing. Now we know future faking when the narcissistic folks do it. They say, I'm going to change. I'm going to therapy. We're going to have kids after this or that happens. Uh, that you're going to get your raise once we get this new contract or next Thanksgiving, we're not going to invite your uncle. Don't worry. And you know the drill. They don't go to therapy. They don't change. They stall things that matter to you. You never see the raise. And the abusive uncle is right there front and center at the next Thanksgiving. But a key part of trauma bonding is when we future fake ourselves. It's a way to hold on to hope and stay in the relationship. It's a way to deny and ignore and not have to deal with the mess in front of us and pin our hopes on a future day. So what does self-future faking look like? Well, one version of it is when we do it about the narcissistic person or the narcissistic relationship. So we'll say things like, oh, they're going through a tough time at work. Once this deadline passes, everything's going to be so much better. Or, I know they're working lots of late nights so we can buy a home one day. As a way, and you say that to yourself, as a way not only to talk yourself out of their inappropriate and shady behavior, but also connect it to the future fake. You get two for the price of one there. Or you might say to yourself, you know, they said they're looking for a therapist and I know that once they work through their trauma, it's all going to be so much better. I just need to be patient and I'm really a cold, horrible person if I don't give them the time they need to work through their stuff. So you get the double fun of self-blame on that self-future fake. Or another one could be, I know that next year's summer vacation is going to be different. I am sure it's going to be so much better. So that's one set of future faking about the relationship. But then there's the future faking that we do that also involves ourselves. So we may, we may say things to ourselves like, ah, once I get myself some therapy, this relationship's going to be so much better because I'm too anxious and I need to work on that. So you get self-blame plus future faking. Or another could be, you know, I've got to do the work. I've got to plan more date nights for us. I just need to be more affectionate to him and just express more gratitude. And then things are going to get so much better. Now, in this case, you are putting the future hopes for the relationship 
on the changes you will make in yourself. Now, I am confident you can make those changes. I really am. The problem is that those changes are not going to result in the change you hope to see in the relationship. Change in you is not going to change the narcissistic relationship. But you link your changes, which are also going to take a minute, as changes do, to what you think will happen because of the self-blame as well. And that results in that type of self-future faking that focuses on the change that make that you make that you believe can change the relationship down the line. It just doesn't work that way in the narcissistic relationship. Self-future faking is kind of another word for justification, like we would see in the trauma-bonded framework, but it involves something that will happen down the line, and it is almost always coupled with self-blame. I'm being too demanding. They have a tough backstory. Or around denial and self-reassurance. Um, this just has to get better. It's going to get better. It has to get better. Cognitive dissonance would be raised if you decided to stay in something that is never going to get better, right? Oh, I'm going to stay in a relationship where I want children, but my partner doesn't. Or Thanksgiving with my family always means my abusive uncle is there. Those statements are uncomfortable. So in order to make these relationships work, you level up the, def the dissonance by making it about the future. Next year is going to be different. But by now, you know it won't be. To make the pieces fit in a narcissistic relationship, you make a bet about the future. And since you cannot predict the future, and hope can really muddy the waters of really thinking accurately in terms of probability, well, then what you have is that you keep making these promises to yourself. Once they get the promotion, once the kids move out, once we move to a bigger house, once your sister moves out, once they go to therapy, once they end their affair, once the summer is over, then. The challenge here is that not only are you living in the future instead of now, you still are living in a future that's never going to happen. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. Some things may change if a person gets a promotion or you have a child or whatever the shift may be. Circumstantial things will change. Maybe there'll be more money. Maybe there'll be less money, but also potentially more stress. For example, the arrival of a new baby, miraculous as it may be, is stressful as hell unless you are a rich person who isn't having to deal with the messiness and the sleepless nights, and it is an unfathomable level of stress if you are not well-resourced and you're doing this with a narcissistic co-parent. So yes, elements of life can change. Certain things will happen, can happen, but what will not change are the patterns inherent in a narcissistic relationship gaslighting, manipulation, blame shifting, rage, or difficulties with frustration, lack of empathy, entitlement, arrogance, all of that is not going to change. As always, if you remain in one of these relationships, you have to remain with the recognition, not easy, but that right there is radical acceptance, or you get out, not easy, but that right there, that's the fear of the unknown. But please, Try not to future fake yourself, because when you do that, you end up blaming yourself more. Oh, I'm so stupid because I believe they would change. You are human. You love someone. You want to believe in them, in all of it. But if you want to assess a relationship, look at it now, today, because that's the that. Not on what you think it could look like one day because there's no evidence of that happening. If the fundamentals suck today, then that needs to be the basis of the decision. And odds are, the fundamentals will suck down the line as well. Yeah, you just may be living in a different house or have more or less money or have kids or not, but the fundamentals of a narcissistic relationship will remain the same over time. You can count on the narcissistic folks future faking you. Don't make it more difficult by doing it to yourself. 
I want you to imagine the layers of an onion peeling away layer after layer until you get to the sort of the more solid core of the onion. Now I want you to imagine that onion is you and that what is being peeled away layer after layer are the parts of you that make you you. To be in a narcissistic relationship, sadly, it's sort of finding yourself in a relationship that is peeling away the layers of you and then discarding them. Your humor, quirks, aspirations, emotions, beliefs, preferences, and hopes. One layer after the other. It's the only way the relationship with any narcissistic person can work. But here's the problem. It's not what you signed up for. You didn't know that that was what was happening. It wasn't literally like you said, okay, this year, I'm just gonna peel it all away. I'm gonna discard all of my quirks. Next year, I'm gonna get rid of all of my emotions. All narcissistic relationships, again, are a gradual process of, undo of undoing you. You may have written it off as compromise or obedience, or you internalized the shame that was thrown at you for doing those things. When we are in a narcissistic relationship, all of our layers get pulled away and discarded. And that just leaves a sort of functionary core, which is consistent with what lots of survivors of narcissistic relationships say. They say, I sometimes feel like I'm going through the motions of life. I get up, I keep the trains running on time, but I'm often confused and maybe this is as good as life gets. It's not. First, you may wonder, why does this happen? Why did my onion layers just all get to go away? Well, because there's only one reality that's permitted in a narcissistic relationship and that's theirs. These relationships are a slow eradication using a combination of techniques, invalidation, shifting between good and bad days, gaslighting, manipulation, making you believe you want the same things as them, shaming you for your ambition, calling you overly dramatic when you show emotion, insulting you when you attempt or something or try something new, future faking you. These things take time. And when they are done, you start to believe that if I'm just better, if I was just less emotional, less challenging, if I just go along with what they want, if I keep things just so, then all of this will be okay. The good day, bad day thing happens because they don't give a damn about you as a separate person. So if by luck, your interests happen to be aligned with theirs, or you make them look good or feel good, well, then that's a good day in your relationship. On most other days, your needs, your existence, your wants, it's an affront to them. And that's when you see all of the ugly narcissistic patterns come at you. But those good days make you think that maybe there is some control in this process for you. There isn't. No more than you can control the weather. It's their emotional space. You're just leasing space in it and they reserve the right to evict you at any time you want and come in and tell you you're not doing your place right. So the longer term survivor becomes the proverbial shell of themselves, that very inside core of the layered onion, that robot part of you that can get things done, but it's missing the poetry that's you. Your big laughter and capacity for joy and the silliness and the adventure and the courage and the ambition, all that stuff that's you, because none of that is permissible in a narcissistic relationship. The part that basically acts as a psychological servant to the narcissistic people, past and present, that's all that gets left after a while. I've worked with a lot of long-term survivors, those who have endured it from childhood, those in long-term committed relationships, and this shell functioning robotic core experience haunts many of them, which is why a major part of healing is to give yourself permission to find even the smallest joys and breathe them in, to journal anything to find yourself and find your way back to yourself. 
This whole process pisses me off to no end. Sure, we can get gaslighted and raged at and betrayed and cheated on and all of the misery that is the narcissistic relationship. But the sacrifice of so many people's good stuff, good people's good stuff, that's what angers me. The wake-up call for the world has to be that there's no pleasing them. To please a narcissistic person means that we have to become mind readers who have no needs, no feelings, no individuality, no autonomy, no hopes, no dreams, no aspirations, no achievements. And that we show up with what they want, when they want. We look the way they want, cook the way they want, work the way they want, screw the way they want, clean the way they want. Again, these relationships are psychological servitude. And what we know about servitude is that the employers, masters, people in charge have no interest in the sovereignty and separateness of the servant. They want them to do their job quietly and get out. That is not a relationship. That is a dehumanizing worker setup. You deserve better, I deserve better, we all deserve better. And the world deserves and needs to see you and your gifts. Start finding all those layers that were peeled away and find them and start gluing them back on. This is a slow, painful, arduous process, especially if this layer chopping happened as early as childhood. Finding your layers and gluing them back on is an act of defiance, of rebellion, and of salvation. The world needs the survivors to find their voices again, because without that, all we're going to get to hear is the noise, the anger, and the rage of the narcissistic folks amongst us. Thanks again.